Great. Um, so thank you, Aisha, uh, and also to the BCS for this award. Um, I'm really excited uh, to be selected for this award. And what I'm going to do today is tell you a little bit about the history of interactive information retrieval. Um, and throughout my talk, I want to weave in some of Karen's words. Um, in preparing for this talk, I went back and looked at her um, keynote that she gave when she received the Salton Award in 1988, which is published in Sig IR Forum. So again, more re recommended reading for you. Um, and it was really nice to be able to see a lot of things that she was saying, um, that she was sort of suggesting that people do, actually did get done. Uh, and it was also interesting to see a lot of things that she was saying are still things that are relevant today. So I've tried to weave in uh, some quotes from her throughout this presentation. Uh, primarily what I'm going to be talking to you about, though, is, again, the his historical context for interactive IR to look at where we've been, uh, where we are, uh, and also where we might go in the future. During this discussion, I will also weave in some of my personal stories. Um, Aisha mentioned that one can only work for 10 years in this field. It turns out I've been doing this research for about 15 years, but a lot of that was as, as a student. Um, and one thing that I hope to convince you today is that the 1990s was a really great time to be in information retrieval. Um, that was when I was a student. Uh, and um, I've recently been had the opportunity to reflect on how nice that was uh, to be a student in the 90s and how freeing um, it was not to be working under the context of search engines. Um, and it really makes a difference. So hopefully I'll uh, be able to convince you to possibly even look back at the research from the 90s. So as I mentioned, um, a lot of this talk is about history. Um, and this is a really, uh, I think, funny quote from Karen that was uh, part of the introduction to the history unit of the book that she co-edited with Peter Willett, uh, which was a text that was used and maybe still is used to a certain extent in IR courses. Um, and as you can see from this quote, uh, Karen believed that looking at history was extremely important. Uh, and if you look back in history, in information retrieval, you will notice, as, as John mentioned in his introduction, uh, that there's a lot of things that, and ideas that people had in the 60s and 70s and 80s uh, that actually are in operation today, that are in practice today. And there's a lot of things and ideas that never, people never were really able to explore very deeply because of the technological constraints. So another thing that I would like for you to think about today is the extent to which our thinking about what kind of research research we do is constrained by the systems that we have. Back in this time period, although th there were system limitations, people still thought very innovatively and thought 20 and 30 years ahead, uh, not just the here and now. And their thinking wasn't just constrained by what they could do right now and what they could make systems do right now, uh, but rather thinking about um, times when the systems uh, uh, would far exceed what they were at this particular point in time. So if you, as you notice, part of my talk is about uh, contours and convergence. So I thought I would provide just a couple of definitions of those. So uh, as you can, can think about a contour as being uh, this sort of projection or, or cycle of how things happen. So I will be talking about that. And then also convergence. And so another thing I want to ask you to think about in this talk is the extent to which our research has possibly converged um, over time and if it's time to start some divergence. Uh, so I want you to, to think about that. To start, though, I want to tell you just a little bit about user studies. So I do what is called user studies in this field, even though I'm not necessarily a fan of that label, but it is descriptive and most people understand what that means. Um, I think about more interactive information retrieval where we're actually thinking about how people use systems uh, to accomplish search tasks, uh, not just necessarily the, the algorithms or indexing techniques that are used. But I wanted to spend just a little bit of time because I understand this audience uh, may have uh, very different backgrounds, sort of uh, familiarizing you with the different kinds of user studies that we actually see in our field. And this is a, a diagram that I used in the methods and in interactive information retrieval uh, uh, monograph that I wrote. And it also is something that we used uh, in a historical retrospect um, that, I, that recently was completed. Um, this was a retrospect that I did with Cassidy Sugimoto, who's at Indiana University. And what we did was look at about 40 years of interactive information retrieval studies. Um, and we did this manually, and we looked at thousands of studies. 
This took years of work to do. In fact, Cassidy had two children along the way. She finished her PhD, and she also got a job. Uh, so this was uh, definitely a labor of love. So some of the comments and uh, assertions that I tell you today will actually come from that work, that empirical work that we did to look at interactive information retrieval research to see um, how it's evolved and changed over time. So I will be referring back to that study. But in that study, we used this uh, diagram to sort of situate uh, the kind of user study that we were looking at and investigating in that systematic uh, review, that historical retrospect. Uh, but what I want to just kind of walk you through is if you look on one end of the continuum, you sort of have the systems-focused studies. And here you can think about studies that are more of trek style studies where you have a test collection um, and you're testing algorithms or indexing techniques. You have QRELs that are given to you and you ch check out, see how well your algorithms or techniques use or, or work. And so that would be the systems-focused end. And then if we move along the continuum, we have the other end is more of a user focused end. And the anchor at that end is the kind of study that doesn't really show it very much at information retrieval. Uh, you might see these kind of studies if you go to uh, conferences focused on information seeking behavior. So these are studies that actually typically use qualitative methods to study really intense work practices of people uh, to map out, and map out and try to model what kinds of things people are actually doing in the real world. And so those kinds of studies typically uh, we see less frequently in the information retrieval literature. And then if you look in the middle, and I'll talk about what's, uh, what comes on the, in the other places as well, but if you look at the middle, this is the kind of study that we might think about as being embodied by the Trek interactive track. Uh, that ran for a number of years and was actually one of the most, uh, made some very important contributions to studying users. And this is a kind of study where you have built a system or perhaps a technique or algorithm and you want to try it out and you want to actually use users in your evaluation. So you may have people come into the lab and you may have half the users use one system and half the users use another system and then you have a set of measures and you say, oh, system A is better than system B uh, based on what people are doing. So this is sort of the user version of this, um, this area here, of just a Trek style evaluation with no users. And we kind of labeled this the archetypal interactive information retrieval study because this is the type or style of study that for a long time, uh, not so much anymore, but for a long time really dominated the literature in interactive information retrieval. Um, and it really comes directly, I think, out of uh, 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 the context and the, the, what was going on uh, during particular, particular times. What you'll also notice in between the archetypal information, interactive information retrieval study and the system-centered studies is that you'll notice uh, log analysis. And so this is a, an area of research that uh, is really, really popular today and probably has been for the last decade, although it has been around in the field ever since it started, um, ever since people were using computers to do retrieval, it was possible to log um, interactions and people were in fact studying logs and trying to use those logs to make assessments and evaluations of systems. Um, and you can think about the studies that are there as studies that primarily use log data to make some sort of assumptions or understandings of what people are doing. And these studies typically are more operational kind of studies where uh, people are using a system and you may not be um, intervening with that person. That person may not be a subject or participant in your lab, but they're using a system. And as a researcher, you can uh, track what they're doing and try to make sense of that. Um, the other two areas that you'll see uh, in between log analysis and, and, and the Trek style evaluation, I've put, uh, some of you may recognize this acronym SDI, which stands for Selective Dissemination of Information, uh, which is the precursors to filtering, if you think about filtering today. So this was an idea by Hans um, Peter Loon a um, very long time ago, a way of trying to get the right information to the right person, and in particular, uh, the person was a scientist, a right, the right information to the right right person at the right time. And so here you can think about how users are involved in this kind of research where they may be providing something like a profile of their interest and then they're just making judgments about, yes, this thing that's being sent to me is good or this thing that's being sent to me is bad. And you're not really so much studying interaction uh, with the system, but you're just collecting these kind of judgments. 
And that's very close to this idea of users make relevance judgments. So a lot of studies that we see today, uh, and that even that I saw yesterday, um, have users, and people use the term users, and that's totally fine, uh, have users who are making relevance judgments. And the real idea of collecting those relevance judgments is to build infrastructure to do more systems-centered evaluation. So it's not so much that people are really interested in what's going on in people's minds or anything like that, but we need to get some labeled data so that we can do something um, later, uh, lot, multiple, multiple cycles and iterations using that labeled data. And so that I've put sort of here as users make relevance assessments. And that's a very, very different kind of study and objective than if you're doing something at the um, archetypal interactive IR study laboratory evaluation, and also very different if you're uh, even doing log analysis. So those are different kinds of studies. And one of the things that I wanted to point out, and I'm, I'm not gonna, I, I can talk to you more about this at the break, but another thing I've noticed is there's a lot of, um, um, I guess, uncertainty about sampling and how you do sampling and how many subjects you need, and that's actually a function of where you are on this continuum, the ways that you would even talk about how you would get a sample and how many people are you need and, and that kind of thing. But I'm not, I'm not gonna go on that dig, uh, dig, uh, digression right now. And then if you, we jump to the, uh, back to the other side over on the right, um, I have a, something called experimental information behavior. And probably one of my favorite examples um, of this work, um, and fortunately I was talking to Philip uh, Redlitsky last night about some work uh, that uh, Thorsten, uh, and, and I think you, you worked on that project too with the click bias. Yeah, is that right? Yeah. So there, there was a, a paper uh, now several years ago uh, where it was shown that people had this click bias, and so um, people would click on the first search result no matter what, uh, even if you inverted the search results. And so this is what I think of as more of an experimental information behavior kind of study because it looks a lot like a, lab, a psychology study where you're actually manipulating something in the environment, and then you're trying to see what people are going to do. And you're trying to see so you kind of get a better idea of like the laws and rules of how people behave. You're not trying to see because you have a system and you want to show system A is better than system B, but you want to try to understand, better understand what people are doing, right? How people are behaving. Um, and so that's what I, that, that's that particular area. Um, and that's one of my favorite areas, I have to say. Uh, and then the last bullet point here, or last prong that I haven't talked about, is the information-seeking behavior with IR systems. And so these are studies, again, we don't really see them a lot at information retrieval conferences, but these are studies uh, that people do when they try to understand how people are interacting with systems. They typically use more exploratory uh, methods and approaches and qualitative methods and approaches to try to do uh, task modeling or document the information seeking process uh, itself. And so this is sort of the world of user studies um, as, as I see it uh, in the information retrieval field. And again, I wanted to, to present this to you because I recognize that maybe not everybody is familiar with all the different variations of user studies and also to kind of give you a framework for, for moving forward and thinking about if you wanted to do a study with users uh, where are you on this continuum? Uh, because that does necessarily imply um, that you would do certain things. So I'm going to move on. Uh, and the next part of my talk, I'm going to uh, seed with a script. Uh, and this is, you can think about a script as something, an example dialogue that helps um, illustrate some point. And this particular script is one that I have engaged in many times with my students. Um, and I should mention, I should mention that I'm, I am an associate professor, so many of my comments are, come from an academic researcher. Um, I haven't worked in industry, so that's, sh you should always uh, keep that in mind. Uh, and I do work a lot with students, and so this is sort of a dialogue I found myself having with students a lot. If you're a faculty member, this may be a dialogue that is familiar to you. If you're a student, might be familiar to you as well. So in walks a student uh, who maybe wants to work on a project. So you might say, so what sort of project would you like to work on? The student says, search interfaces. The professor says, that sounds great. What specifically would you like to do? Well, you know how search engine X has blue hyperlinks? 
What if we use green instead? Um, okay, that's interesting. Do you have any more ideas? Yeah, do you know how Search Engine X puts 10 results on each SERP? Yes. What if we put 12 instead? Okay, any more ideas? Yeah, do you know how Search Engine X, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. <laughs> so again, a conversation that I've had a lot with my students, uh, and in, in fact, recently I had this conversation and I thought, why, why can't students think of anything besides in relation to Search Engine X? Why does Search Engine X ground all my students thinking about what is possible and what they can do. Why can't they think beyond Search Engine X? Why does Search Engine X seem to anchor everything? Why is everything in relation to Search Engine X? And everything is just a slight incremental degree of difference from Search Engine X. Whatever happened to big ideas? And so it got me thinking and I, and I actually told my students, I said, oh, I pointed this out to them and they were like, oh yeah. And I realized that as students, they've always been students when Search Engine X ruled. They've never been students of IR before search engines. And if you were a student of IR before search engines, I believe that you actually had a more, well, I don't want to say more fun time, but it was great. It was very liberating. Now looking back, I can see it was very liberating. And I was quite thankful that when I was a student, these are the kind of things I thought about. So I certainly recognize that as a student, there were things that framed my thinking, right? It wasn't that I was, just because I was in the 90s, I could fr think freely. There were definitely things that constrained my thinking. But this is the kind of stuff I thought about. Oh, copy, tile bars, inquiry. Um, those kinds of systems were what influenced my thinking about what was possible and what, what I wanted to do. And then, of course, if we think about today's student, um, typically, or even a new researcher, and even, I would admit, even myself to a certain extent, because we all live in this world. This is the context in which we work, and it's hard for that context not to influence our thinking, no matter how senior of a researcher we are. It's very hard to think beyond what we see and do every day. Um, and so, if we think about today, these kinds of ideas are, um, um, clouding, I don't want to say clouding our thinking, but definitely uh, constraining, possibly constraining our thinking in some kind of way. So if we think about context of practice, what's interesting is I'm not necessarily picking on search engine X or industry or anything like that. Uh, what you might uh, not realize uh, is that the field of information retrieval has always had research in industry and research in academia. And I found these two really nice quotes uh, from Karen's um, talk that she gave when she won the uh, Salton Award that illustrated uh, some um, ideas of that time and even before about the relationship between um, academic research and um, industry research. And certainly I've been a part of and have heard over many years now discussions about industry versus, ac versus I don't always with versus, versus academia. Uh, what can academ academic researchers do? What can industrial researchers do? So there seems to be this kind of bifurcation that we have, but it is the case that in our field, these two areas, operational and academic, have always existed. If you look in the old literature, you'll see systems like Dialog and Leader Mart and Medlars um, and people working on, um, I think, the NASA uh, TL something, Telcon, um, all sorts of wonderful systems that people were working on that were actually the precursors to many operational systems we see today, typically the more commercial databases. Um, and so these people have always been an important part of information retrieval and, and, and academic and, and researchers have always worked alongside one another. And it looks like they've also always kind of wondered about the extent and goodness of what they were doing in one context or the other. And what I think is interesting about Karen's uh, last, uh, uh, the last part of this quote, this was just one big quote together, but I split it up um, here, uh, is that she says that, uh, the, again, something you might recognize or have heard, and certainly um, 
I hear my students grumbling stuff like this all the time. Uh, the research experiments were so small, the theory was so impenetrable, and the results it gave were at best so marginal and degree in focus that they all seemed irrelevant. And I actually added that emphasis because I think that that can sometimes, that's sometimes how we might feel, especially as a student, we might feel that anything that we can do maybe just isn't that exciting or that important because we're not necessarily doing something in practice at the scale that an industrial uh, search engine is actually doing. So I think it's just kind of an interesting when I saw this uh, to think about this relationship. Um, and also in thinking about this idea of contours and convergence in research in our field, uh, to think about from a historical point of view, uh, if we think about these two as two different research streams that are in information retrieval, the points at which they come together and then diverge. Um, and then come back together so we can think about their trajectories um, over time um, and always being necessarily um, together. So what I want to do next is actually uh, launch into a little bit of history. And I'm going to move relatively quickly through the 60s and 70s uh, because Karen's uh, award keynote uh, went through the 60s and 70s. And so you can read that if you like. But I want to show you a couple of things about interactive IR that was being done at that time. And then we're going to spend a little bit of time, a little bit more time in the 90s. And then we'll, we'll get to the 2000s, uh, which is an era I think we're still, we're, uh, still in, even though some of this stuff is sliced into 10-year decades. So in the 60s and 70s, uh, here we can actually start seeing the origins of the user study. Now, it is the case, uh, interestingly, that when the term user study first showed up, it was used in the context of doing survey, more like survey research, to ask scientists about what their interests were. So that was really where the first user studies were. So it had nothing to do with evaluating your system with people. Uh, but we start seeing this show up more. And this is a passage from um, uh, Salton's, some, um, Eleanor Ide actually from um, Salton's lab who was working on relevance feedback. And so we all think typically of Jerry Salton maybe as not really a user-oriented person or an interactive IR person. But sure enough, just like anything else in IR, they did it uh, in his lab, uh, and they certainly were concerned and were thinking about users. Now, you definitely want to think about, at this time, users were a much different uh, set of people than what we think about as users today. So these were typically very specialized people who had training uh, to use retrieval systems and had extra special knowledge of how things were indexed and organized. Uh, so the users were quite different. Uh, but what I, what I underlined here, and, and sorry, there were no really interesting pictures from this article, so you just get this text. Uh, but what I underlined here is the needs of users of a large information collection, especially a document collection, are too varied to be satisfied with any one full automatic retrieval algorithm. So we start seeing the seeds of these ideas that we need some kind of personalization or some way to tailor retrieval to the individual user. And we also start seeing the ideas that a system itself is necessarily matched on the average user, um, not thinking about varied users. And so, of course, Salton and his team launched a number of studies on relevance feedback, and that was the principal way uh, that uh, information would be, get, would be gotten from users, and that was the principal interaction technique, was to solicit feedback from people about terms and documents and whether they were good or bad. Um, that was it for interaction. And that actually um, dominated interactive IR research for a long time. But something else that was really important that was going on at that time that you may not know about, so I'm guessing most everybody knows about Salton here, but um, also in 1971 was the first workshop that was focused on issues of users in online interactive information systems. And this was a workshop that was convened um, and held in California in the book itself that describes the workshop. So you can get this book um, and have a look at the proceedings. The proceedings are quite wonderful because they have not only all the papers, but somebody documented the entire discussions that were took place. And so you can get the dialogue and the literal discussions that took place amongst the people that were there. And then they also have the schedule, which is fun. And you know, cocktails are listed at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So uh, it's, a, it's a really fun book to look at. Uh, but this book, this workshop was held uh, in response to a challenge paper that was issued by John Bennett, uh, who wrote one of the first uh, 
chapters, review chapters on interfaces and interactive information si retrieval systems. Uh, and basically his challenge paper outlined several issues that he felt that the community needed to address with respect to people using systems. And those issues included uh, figuring out better interaction techniques, um, issues which we don't I think we're starting to see a little bit more of today, but issues of education. So how do we educate the user about what the system can do and how the system can be used? How do we provide feedback to the user about when they're doing things good or bad? Uh, so people, even back then, were talking about these kind of issues. Of course, the, the context of use were, were a little bit different, uh, but some of the issues you may actually recognize uh, and see. And another thing that was quite remarkable about this book is that this workshop was convened in 1971, and the book has a bibliography, and part of the reason this workshop was convened was because this recognition of this growing body of research on interactive information retrieval, and the book has a bibliography that's quite extensive with hundreds and hundreds of studies that were conducted in the 50s and the 60s um, focusing on users. So again, we may think of users as something kind of new, but no. Um, that has always been around. One particular, I couldn't, again, there were lots of interesting images in this book, but none that I thought that you would enjoy looking at, because uh, most of them are, are, are dialogue kinds of systems, because the terminals were just people interacting with a, on a command line as opposed to nice graphical user interfaces. So I will spare you um, those details. But one of my favorite uh, uh, papers was by uh, Catcher, who is a person who wrote about relevance. Um, and McCarn, who was at the National Library of Medicine, uh, and they were talking about how users sort of develop as they use a system, and they uh, documented these three different phases of development. The first phase is the confidence phase, so people actually become confident with trying to use the system. Um, and they note how people were always nervous about using systems, or always afraid they were going to break systems. Uh, and then there's the insight phase, where a person actually understands the possibilities that exist with the system, the power that the system uh, provides, the abilities that the system allows or enables them to do, uh, things that it enables them to do. And then the incorporation phase, so that's actually using uh, the system in a day-to-day -day, uh, setting. And so I thought this was interesting, because again, if we think about this in relation relation to contemporary search, uh, we can question whether or not people go through these phases or not. Um, I would argue that most people, at least the, the students I teach, feel pretty confident um, about their search. I'm not quite sure that they have as much insight as they should about the possibilities that the system can bring to them in terms of solving their work task. Uh, so I think people typically use a very narrow range of search procedures and tactics. Um, and then certainly the incorporation phase, you, one might argue that, that, that's, that that's going well. But if you do go back and look at this book, I would bring your attention to these things. And then the last quote that I thought was interesting from that book uh, was this quote from Roger Summit, who was the, one of the key developers of dialogue. Uh, and he noted uh, something, again, that, that might resonate with you today, that people were like really impressed with the speed of the system. So in the 60, late 60s, I'm sure that speed was you know, mind warping. Um, and it's horizon widening, horizon widening effect. So the way in which the system itself could stimulate their thinking and help them do more, help them go further um, and actually understand more about the information that's in the collection, not just sort of interacting on more of a surface level. So the other last system I want to show you from this, uh, seven, this period was a system by, this is an experimental system by Bob Adi. And this is one of my favorite systems because this system also uh, uh, really try, uh, illustrates this interest in helping a person and trying to create a, a more natural dialogue with that person. Uh, and so as you see at the top, this is again my um, making of screens off from uh, research papers. So there's a little bit of debris at the top of that box that you see up there. But that's just a, a blinking cursor. So again, we can think about what is interaction um, at this time. Uh, so a person would type something. And then this is a sort of typical thing or search result you might get back. So again, just a surrogate that has a list of key terms that's been indexed with. And so you see these are numbered. And the way that the person can interact with the system is to say, yes, I like 13, um, which is respiration. Respiration is good in general, and not six, 
Uh, so not infants or newborns. And so this again was a basic interaction uh, technique. And this was an experimental system. Uh, but And what maybe is experimental about it is, is probably my favorite part about this is that the system was smart enough to know when it was not doing so well. Uh, so the system could kind of watch what the person was doing and then come out with these little uh, witticisms like, we, not you, not me, but we are not doing so well now. Maybe you've already found all the important references. So again, we see this sort of interest in facilitating more of a, a natural dialogue between the, the person and the system, and also the system sort of having, I don't want to say a theory of mind, but uh, at least uh, understanding a little bit about maybe the context and what's going on and the behaviors that it's observing. So I also want to just quickly go through uh, the 80s with you. Um, and again, here, um, I don't have a lot to show you because I really want to get to the 90s. But this is the decade where we first start seeing um, artificial intelligence really make its way into the system. And you can kind of see that alluded to by that system I just showed you. And also when people started thinking a lot about user models. And so these are just a set of titles of some papers from some different uh, publications in our field, uh, notably uh, SIGIR uh, that, I, that I found. And again, no really nice screenshots to show you in these publications. But you'll see, again, a variety of titles that kind of illustrate some of the concerns that people had about users. And then you'll also see at the bottom, uh, which is one of, the, one of the first log analysis studies that I could find in SIGIR proceedings. There's actually two in this particular issue of SIGIR um, that tried to look at uh, just using the log data, uh, try to analyze user behavior and figure out something about failures and successes in the systems. Um, this is just showing you uh, this idea of user modeling. So here you can see the first shot just shows you an example, again, of what people were trying to do uh, with, with understanding that a person could be characterized along several dimensions uh, that were in dimensions of interest, we'll say, and they could even be have these dimensions weighted, and these different dimensions could be invoked at different times as a person searched in order to sort of tailor retrieval in some way to that person. So this is where we start seeing this idea of keeping a persistent memory of what the person's interests are. And then the other nice passage that I found uh, illustrates this interest and, again, outstanding problem with trying to figure out how to incorporate more than just information about the user into the search, but a recognition that it's a lot more than just the user, but also the tasks that they're trying to accomplish and other kind of situational variables and contextual variables that can impact um, search. So this screen is from iCubed R, which is a, another uh, often uh, uh, discussed uh, interface, which was worked by Bruce Croft uh, and, and uh, Thompson. And this, again, you can start seeing where, this is an experimental system, but you can start seeing where people are trying to use more graphical uh, uh, kinds of elements. And so the interface itself is changing in terms of what people, how people interact uh, from just uh, typing in keywords on a command terminal to actually being able to click around a little bit. And then the last example I brought to share with you is something called Superbook, which many of you may have heard of. And this Superbook is, is, a, is, a, is more of a, a sort of interface for interacting with a large, uh, you can think about it as a book, but it's actually a collection of a whole bunch of stuff. And what you can see here is this is more of a, an environment where a person has a whole lot of tools at their disposal that's not just focused on searching, uh, but they have tools that can um, help them explore the, the, uh, the information source in more ways than just typing a query. So you have sort of a more fuller featured, more uh, larger set of tools at, at your disposal. Now, what I want to shift to now is to the 90s. And, and again, here's an opportunity to put in some words from Karen, who in 1988 uh, said, suggested that user studies were the way forward, especially with understanding relevance feedback. Um, and so what I would, would argue is that, uh, I don't know necessarily based on what she said, we would certainly do see this huge takeoff of what I think are uh, um, uh, more interesting kinds of user studies. And part of that is because of technology enabled things. Um, and what we will see in the 90s is really a lot of novel user interfaces for people. And what I want to point out is, and get you to think about now is like how many novel interfaces do you see in our research today? Not, not very many. Um, 
If you look through uh, SIG IR proceedings, most all these things I'm going to show you are from SIG IR proceedings. You don't really have a hard time finding any kind of interesting interface. Uh, and so we can kind of ask ourselves, where has all this research gone? But this is tile bars, and this is, and I was, again, kind of, as, you know, hopefully not interpreted as making fun of students before, but when I was a student, this is what I stared at for hours, trying to figure out how I could make some small change to it, uh, and that be my research project. So, again, not to say that I wasn't also influenced by something, but this is a, the tile bars, which was a system created in 95, which was really just a, an interface that helped people understand the relevance of particular documents. And so, so this is work by Marty Hurst, and you see a, a bar representation next to each document that's been retrieved that indicates the different coloring there, indicates the appearance of the different query words that are typed up here. You actually have three um, different lines for each bar that correspond to each of those three queries that you see up, up, up above. And then this actually shows the length of the document. So this is the beginning of the document, the end of the document. This document is longer than that document. And the shading indicates the portions of the document that are most relevant for those particular queries. So again, kind of a nice tool to try to help a person better understand the search results uh, much better and much different than, than what we're accustomed to seeing today. This is another tool that was designed um, by Verisami and Belkin, which uh, allowed people to better understand all of the search results uh, as well, but really trying to get into getting people to look way down the list. So what these bars show you are also fre their frequencies that show you the distribution of your query word across a bunch of different documents uh, in a collection. And so you can see each of the query words listed here, and then the documents are listed um, on that axis. So that, again, is a tool or technique that helps a person not just go to the first 10 results, uh, but possibly dive into the middle of the results um, at some other place so that makes access easier. Easier. This interface uh, maybe doesn't look so great to you, but uh, uh, back then it was quite interesting. This was also work by Marty Hurst. Uh, this was something called Catacone, and this was um, the uh, uh, or sorry, this was scatter gather, and this was trying to um, implement the clustering hypothesis in a system. This was be, uh, initially Doug Cutting and, and uh, 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 David Crager tried to figure out a way of using the clustering hypothesis, and so Hearst came up with an interface that would allow a person to actually uh, uh, control clustering uh, in some kind of way. And it was through a mechanism called scatter gather. So again, not so pretty visually, but it's a tool that allows a person to manipulate search results results in a different kind of way. This is Catacone, which I think is the most mind-blowing um, of all these images that I'm showing to you. And again, I, I bet I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, this is, these things are awful. Right? You're probably thinking, again, based on what you're used to today and where, where we are and what we think of as the common standard that guides and frames our judgments of what's good and bad, you're probably thinking, this looks awful. Uh, but it actually gives people lots of great tools. You have this really interesting concept browser in the back that helped address the vocabulary problem. You have a little bookshelf over here that basically is support for saving results over sessions over time um, and accumulating things. You have a document viewer over here that has all sorts of special widgets just for uh, viewing documents. So these are tools a person would want to use when they were doing that. And then you have this dashboard that allows you to uh, do additional functionality. So pretty uh, fully featured environment. Not just a search, but a search environment. Uh, this is another example. This is work by uh, Jean Golovchinsky, which is just looking at different ways of displaying search results. And so this uses a newspaper metaphor, and you can actually view a whole bunch of documents simultaneously on the screen. And then in the lower uh, right-hand corner, you see something that allows you to get better information about each of the different documents. So we see this today maybe when we do tabbed-based browsing or something like that, when we open up search results in different tabs, but most systems don't really allow us to kind of do comparison, contrast, and synthesis across documents in any sort of uniformed way. 
And then the last one, well, actually, this next to the last one, the, the next to the last one I want to show you is Data Mountain, which also uh, was closer towards the end of the 90s when people really were interested in visualization. Um, and this is just a way of helping people, again, sort results, cluster results, make sense of results. Um, and you can also imagine using all this information like space and clustering in some sort of retrieval technique. So this is, again, just a more extensive environment for searching. Now this is the last one I want to show you because this one I can confess to you that I actually worked on this one. So this was my uh, introduction to interactive information retrieval uh, in the form of this. And it took me years after I finished my PhD to be able to look at this again because every time I looked at it I cringed. I thought, oh, it's awful. Um, but this was a, a, a sort of, and it's somewhat typical of the research that was being done in the 90s which really, really focused a lot on relevance feedback which was shown in systems IR studies to be so, so effective, so, so important. So a lot of the interfaces and interaction techniques were circled around um, explicit relevance feedback. And so this is a system that I worked on with Nick uh, Belkin, who was my advisor and a number of other people over many, many years. And then this, was, this paper was sort of the culmination of all that research. And what you see in this system, uh, which interestingly, the, it was a, a, a separate system all by itself that ha you had to type in a whole bunch of commands to get it to run. The interface was written in something called Tickle, I think. Um, and it was a lot of work to make one of these. So you can imagine today, again, into, in the web environment, one nice thing is that it's a little bit easier to quickly make prototypes and things like that. Back then, it was, this was painstaking work to make such a thing exist. And the other interesting thing to keep in mind is that in all these, these interfaces that I've showed you up until this point, most of the searchers were professional searchers or people who were training to be professional searchers. So this, this wasn't the average person on the street coming into the lab using these systems. These systems were being used and tested on people who had search expertise. And when I would watch people use these systems, it was always very fun because people, it took, it, as you can imagine, it took people a long time to figure out how to use them. We typically provided lots of training and it was common for all the research at that time, training for people to use these systems. Um, and people really had a lot of stuff to get used to, a lot of stuff uh, going on and understand. And what you see on this interface is a list of search results. The full text is shown here. This is just a window that's, that's uh, popped up at that point. You see uh, the user has the ability to mark documents as good and bad. Marking something as bad would, for example, populate the bad terms to avoid list, and so this is negative relevance feedback. The marking something as good would populate the good terms to add. Uh, so again, you're trying to get information from the person uh, about what they like and don't like, and also trying to give them facilities that help them make better queries uh, without having to think of uh, words by themselves. And then there's also a saving, uh, a visible saving um, list down there that's not viewable here. So again, we think about this as being really, really uh, clunk clunky. And as a result, when we moved into the 2000s, where we look at uh, user modeling and artificial intelligence part two, um, I think what we noticed was that interfaces like that and research like that, and even findings from research like that, basically killed off any kind of explicit feedback. So based on all that research that was done, um, and I certainly have been an author on lots of papers that concluded these things are too complicated for people to use. They're too cognitively burdensome. They're, people People want something really easy. Explicit feedback is bad. Um, and in fact, I, when I did my dissertation, I did my dissertation on implicit feedback because uh, that was how much I believed that explicit feedback was bad. But now that I have some perspective, I look back on it and I think, well, I think that was maybe, that was a conclusion that was made in a particular pr uh, context of practice with particular kinds of users doing particular kinds of tasks. Um, in a particular era where not everybody was using a computer all the time. So today we think about people spending hours uh, providing feedback to all sorts of different kinds of applications and services and they have no problem doing that. Um, people, a lot more people know about search and so you can think about the conclusions that we actually read in research papers as well as being bound very much by the time in which those conclusions were made and the context in which the research was being done. Um, so uh, this, again, kind of research killed off explicit feedback. 
And then what we see are a huge number of studies, um, which I think have continued to this day on using implicit feedback, doing large scale web log analysis, um, and using machine learning to try to understand what's going on. Now, I tried to find a nice picture from some contemporary paper to illustrate this line of research, uh, but you might imagine that this is what I found. Uh, so there's a fairly typical illustration uh, in such a paper. Uh, and so, uh, and this is actually a, a, a nice paper that I'm, I'm going to refer to later. Uh, so I thought I would just use it here to illustrate this picture. Uh, but this is what we typically see. So no more of these interesting search interfaces, but we see a lot of um, features um, and models uh, and functions um, in the research. And I'm not saying it's bad. In fact, I'll tell you all the great and wonderful things about it in just a minute. So what you can see in this large scale log analysis is basically you have a person uh, and there's a bunch of who's using a system, you hope it's a person anyway, but in most cases it is using a system who's generating a bunch of signals that you then use to build a model. Uh, so some sort of model of user behavior and we saw some really great examples of those yesterday in some of the presentations. Uh, you can also think even more about the kind of studies that are done that are A-B testing, which look like experiments, which are experiments, uh, where you use such a technique, you use the log data to evaluate whether something is good or bad. So you can kind of go beyond just having this model that's descriptive and predictive of what people are going to do to thinking about studies that allow you to evaluate systems or evaluate techniques. So those are kind of two separate things that we want to think about. And all the wonderful things uh, from this research include what I would, uh, would argue is a more preeminence of behavioral-based uh, research and looking at how users behave. Uh, I think a preeminence for user studies and interactive IR. I think so many people now are interested in, in users and these kind of studies that it's really fantastic. Uh, and so it's really, really has kicked off and ushered in a new time uh, for that kind of research. We also see, of course, naturally, especially if it's a search log, we see more uh, uh, diverse populations being included, so we're able to say something more about a larger range of people. Uh, we have also, I think, uh, this research has ushered in and drawn attention to a lot of statistical approaches and modeling techniques that have really was at, that were really absent from the literature uh, up to this point uh, that this was being done. And then we also see an increase uh, just in interactive IR and user studies. So uh, this kind of research has had lots and lots of positive benefits to it. Now, there are a few negative benefits as, or limitations rather as well. So the first one you can imagine is that I did draw that black box around that person for a reason. Uh, people are really kind of treated like black boxes and that are generating all these signals, which again are really great and can be used, especially in large quantity, uh, to do all sorts of interesting things. But one thing that we haven't actually thought about, uh, as far as I know, is even though we have this kind of model, we don't really think about these two different kinds of treatments or uh, experiments where we have two different conditions and then building models based on how people behave in each one of those conditions. The typical uh, procedure or method is to think about those, an A-B experiment is something that gives you informa evaluative information about what technique is working better or worse, but not necessarily creating models of behavior of people using each of those different instantiations and then having those models tell you something about uh, more robust about how people behave. Um, some other limitations, I think, is that we have a lot of models, but we, I'm not sure about the extent to which they generalize, uh, and, and I think that's another issue. And let's see. I can't see my notes, so I've forgotten the last point I wanted to tell you um, about a limitation, but uh, those are some of the main ones there. So we can, again, think about how this, this research has told us a lot of things, but a lot of times these models um, are kind of built on a one-size-fit-all basis. And I put this pair, this uh, passage back, this is one you've seen before, but I've underlined something else uh, from uh, uh, Ide's work. So users whose needs best match the assumptions built into the system are satisfied and others are not. So again, we can think about the extent to which these models necessarily have to be more general models that are based on the, the av average searcher as opposed to things that are based on very specific um, search characteristics. 
And what I want us to think about now is the extent to which the research maybe has reached this point of convergence, uh, where we are focused on this kind of study, but we're not really thinking about other kinds of studies that we could be doing. Um, and again, as people in a social system, science is a, is, I do have the perspective that science is a social enterprise and that what we choose to work on, the methods we choose to use, um, not just students, but researchers and, and, and faculty as well as industry researchers, a lot of that is colored by contemporary thinking and contemporary ideas. And if what we, if we're only repeating what we see in published research up until this point, we need to question the extent to which we're really being innovative and forward thinking like some of those people uh, from 30 years past. So I like this quote because uh, Karen was lamenting about the general lack of snap, crackle, and pop um, evident in research. And, and I might argue that maybe we need a little more snap, crackle, and pop these days too. So again, to look at convergence and think about a question for you whether we have converged in our research or not. And then what I want to end with are just some future uh, directions or future contours uh, that I think we, we might consider going in. So the first one is, uh, is you know, I think really important. And, and this, uh, this came up because I have to, I teach undergraduates. Uh, we were recently looking at uh, term weighting. Uh, in the vector space model. And they said, well, where do those terms come from? And I said, well, you know, the system comes up with them. They said, well, what, what if we came up with those terms? Could we put weights associated with words? How would, would the, could we do that? I said, no, researchers think you're too stupid to do that. Like you, you can, and it's true. I mean, this general, and so then I started feeling really condescending uh, telling my students this because they look at me very strangely in, in, in this puzzled look. But again, all these conclusions about how bad explicit feedback is, how much people don't want to look under the hood, how we don't want to have systems that are somewhat transparent, at least for certain types of users. I'm not saying everybody needs to go under the hood and do tuning or do this or do that. Uh, but these kind of conclusions were, came from research in a specific period of time. And I think it's really important to start thinking about uh, these issues with contemporary users and in contemporary environments. And I also think it's really important to start thinking about different kinds of search environments and different kinds of tools. And hopefully you might be inspired by some of those interfaces I showed you from the 90s uh, and think about how those things might be updated or changed to match uh, today's searcher. The other thing I want to uh, advocate for, which sounds, again, really strange, and I, and I actually gave a talk at the Information Interaction in Context Conference last year, and I advocated for the same thing, and I still believe it today, so, I, so I'm going to say it again, um, is that we need to stop asking people if they're satisfied. It's just a cycle, right? Are you satisfied? No, I'm not satisfied because it's not like search engine X. Okay, my system's a failure. So it's this sort of self-fulfilling uh, cycle that we're on where we continuously are concerned with whether people are satisfied. And I had this really great conversation with Yop last night and Yop said, you know what, people should, people should be uncomfortable uh, when they're facing a search interface because they might be actually be learning something. Um, and if you already know everything, then you know, what difference does it make? So maybe we should be thinking about creating environments that make people a little uncomfortable because they have to work a little bit harder uh, to figure out how to use the system. They have different kind of tools they could use, which would then more importantly allow them to go further with their search, allow them to learn more, allow them to engage more deeply uh, with whatever it is, that, whatever task it is that they're trying to fulfill. Uh, and so you can think about more integrated kinds of search environments with more tools. Not for everybody, not for every kind of search, but certainly there is a class of people who might appreciate more um, interesting kinds of tools. Um, oh, sorry, and I moved over off the of satisfaction. But the other things I wanted to advocate for with the first satisfaction is to create uh, measures and methods that are focused on studying people. So if you look at, a, at SIGIR proceedings or ECIR proceedings, there's almost always, I, I don't know if it's true for this year, but there are almost always sessions on evaluation measures, okay? And what are those? You know, NDCG, which I love, or, or this measure, or that measure, you know, 5,000 million measures for how to decide whether a set of search results are good or not, according to a system point of view. Zero measures about how to decide whether a person is satisfied, quote unquote. Uh, zero measures about how to catalog the interaction or understand the behavior, understand what's going on. 
Uh, and so we don't really have very much research that looks at creating good measures. And when I say good measures, I mean measures that have been put to the test, not just me sitting around in a room thinking, oh, I think I'll create this um, and then create it and, and put it in a paper, but measures that have been demonstrated to be effective and good and valid and reliable. We don't really have a lot of measures or even methods for doing that for studying people. And I'll not go into method variance right now since I'm about out of time, or I'm way out of time. Uh, but I'll tell you, I can tell you about that at the break. Uh, then the last couple of things I would like to advocate, advocate for are developing more formal languages and methods for understanding and characterizing interaction. So the paper that I referred to earlier by uh, Sue Dumay and Doug Downey where I showed all those features, um, part of that paper was trying to develop a language for understanding search behavior. And a lot of people use things like you know, states and Markov modeling and all this kind of interesting thing to try to understand behavior and interaction. But the languages themselves I think are quite impoverished. Uh, and I think, and I don't have the answer for this, that's why it's on future here, uh, but thinking about how we can formally model what going on during search and not just have states for system but also have states for the person at a real meaningful level so not just have the person doing this but uh, more of a finer division of what's going on with the person and this of course could be used to better understand task-based search sessions um, and also to create session-based evaluation measures because you might end up with units that are smaller than the search or the query search result set uh, you can think about even uh, uh, smaller segmentations um, of what's going on during the search. And then uh, the last thing with, with respect to research practice uh, is thinking about creating different kind of statistical techniques for analyzing results. And so again, one of the great things about the, the uh, large scale log analysis is the introduction of a lot of different kinds of analysis techniques that weren't really being done that much previously. Uh, previously in all those studies I showed you of interface X versus interface Y, people set those studies up and you end up doing analysis like analysis of variance or t-test or something like that be just because of the nature of the study. Um, but I think that there's a lot more different kinds of statistical techniques that we could use that would actually help us create better models um, and, do more, uh, and help us better understand and analyze our data. And then the last thing I want to say is something more about research practice in general, so not the content or how we do it, but more just about the speed at which we do it, which seems to me to be really insane. Um, people, and myself included, I'm not uh, saying that I'm different from this, uh, is that we work at such a fast pace these days, much faster, I would argue, uh, than people in the 70s and 80s had to work. We publish and spin out papers left, right, and center, and there's a lot of dangers to this, and so uh, since I could stand up here and tell you something, I wanted to tell you this and wanted to point out to you and get you to think about the faster that we go, the more likely we're making mistakes. Uh, there's just no question about it. So if we're on this super fast paced publication cycle, um, it's likely that we have mistakes in our research. And some of these mistakes we may know, some of them we may find later. But a lot of them we're not ever going to know because we're not ever going to go bother to look back at what we did. We're going to go on to the next thing. Uh, we might look at it, the results, but we're not often looking very deeply at what we did or thinking very critically about what we did. And so the mistakes part is something I really wanted to, to get people thinking about. And we don't really have any mechanism in our field for correcting mistakes. Uh, so if one did discover that this experiment that I published in CIGIR last year was actually bogus because somebody made an error in data analysis or something like that, there's no way really to retract that uh, in, in any kind of way. And so you really want to encourage people to think about the speed and what, what are some of the negative uh, finding, uh, negative um, impacts of this, this speed that we move at. And then the last thing that I want to encourage people to do, and, and I realize that if you're in industry you may not have this luxury, but I want to encourage people to read more and experiment less. And I'll end with just a couple of final thoughts uh, from Karen, so I'll let her, her have the last words. Uh, in this talk. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>